Hello everyone. Welcome to um, week five. And week five, we are covering relationships and communication for autistic people. And, you know, I think that this is a really important topic because oftentimes my autistic clients really want, especially the ones who have been late identified, um, but kind of everyone want to have that space in, in therapy to discuss, you know, what, how does being autistic impact my relationships? How can I communicate my needs in a community or society that doesn't always understand my needs? And how can I thrive with making connections to other people? There's kind of a myth that autistic people don't care about others. And the research these days is actually showing quite the opposite, that we feel empathy strongly, that we feel um, fairness concerned and have connection needs that are similar uh, to neurotypicals, but we just express them differently or they show up differently how we, how we want to connect. And um, you know, I think we've talked about in the past the idea of the double empathy theory, and this was a really wonderful theory and research was done that showed that autistic people, like if you take an autistic person and you put them in a group of holistic people or neurotypical people, then the autistic person might struggle socially or be perceived to struggle socially. Um, and yet also if you take an holistic person and if you put them in a group of autistic pe people, that person would struggle or could struggle socially or be perceived as struggling socially. And yet when you take those people and you put them in their neurotype groups, like an autistic person in a group of autistic people or an holistic person in a group of holistic people, they're more likely to be accurately um, perceived, their social, the way that they interact, and more favorably, and they're more likely to have a more favorable experience. And, and I think that that idea of, um, double empathy, it, it applies to many things other than just empathy in how we relate to other people. And so both for autistic people, it's wonderful for us to, for us to understand the differences so that we can feel more empowered in interacting with others and know how to talk about our needs as differences, not problems that we have. But also that's really wonderful for neurotypical or holistic loved ones or co-workers to begin to understand that again autistic people aren't bad socially or messed up in relationships we just have different needs and different ways of being and so i'll cover some of the topics today there are also some books and people who are autistic people who are writing about relating and I always encourage people to find groups of other autistic people, whether it's a therapy group, workshops, um, wonderful to have an autistic therapist, although that can be hard to find. Um, but yeah, spaces where you can be with other autistic people really will help you to understand like where you want to grow as a human in relationship to others or maybe what you want to celebrate about yourself. Um, you know, autistic people do tend to gravitate to, towards other neurodivergent people. So even if autistic adults don't know that they're autistic, many times after they've been diagnosed or identified, they'll look around and be like, oh, many of my friends are ADHD or autistic. And many of my lovers are, my romantic relationships have been ADHD or autistic. There's, I think we tend to gravitate towards people who have similar processing. Um, just it's natural, right? Like when we start talking to somebody, if they seem to understand us, that's going to be possibly more attractive than somebody who it feels like they don't get us. Um, being autistic, of course, runs in families. 
And this can be incredibly wonderful because we tend to understand each other, but there can be some complications like if autistic family members, maybe some are not diagnosed and some are, there can be some um, projection of ableism from the people who have not been diagnosed or I've even seen families where the parents were undiagnosed and the children are diagnosed and the parents have a real, really hard time setting boundaries or figuring out when to say no to the child because it's difficult to figure out um, how to support a child when you were not supported as an autistic person. Um, also, another common thing with families that I think I've talked about before is that a newly identified or diagnosed person will say in, to people in their family, I'm autistic, and the family members will say, you can't be autistic because you're just like us, or you're so much like us. And um, that's usually because those family members are either autistic or ADHD. For in communicating with autistic people, it's important to know that we need rules to make sense. We need, if there's going to be like a societal rule, it can't just be because of tradition for us. It's usually, usually we want there, it to make sense and be ethical and to be logical. Those are usually autistic um, values. Intimacy is a, like a whole nother subject, but it's definitely worth looking at. I think seeing a sex therapist who knows about autistic um, experience can be really helpful or even just reading books and to know that to to know that our needs are important again it's like being autistic and our needs for for intimacy or sexuality or closeness may be different but again not less and there are resources out there and more and more coming out now on um, autistic relationships specific to intimacy and sexuality. There are also lots of resources on the autistic people in the workforce. Many autistic people will give examples of how difficult it's been for them in certain work environments versus other work environments and how some work environments really help them to feel safe and connected and good because the people understand them or they have the sensory um, right environment, etc. And then how other workplaces could really make them feel shamed or black sheep or uncomfortable. And there's a book called Neurodiversity Rising, Workplace Neurodiversity Rising by Lyric Rivera, which is an excellent book just really on that topic of how autistic people fit it to the workforce and workplaces and relating um, both to their own needs in those places, but also to other people. Their, a common experience of autistic people is wondering whether they perceive relationships in the way that other people do many, many autistic people have had the experience of thinking that they were close to somebody or somebody was a close friend and then realizing later, oh, I'm not that close to somebody or like somebody's been flirting with me and I didn't even realize they were flirting with me. So kind of not getting what other people, how other people are perceiving interactions. And again, that's neurotypical people are holistic people generally. Um, and I think being in groups of autistic people, there's more allowance for explicit, like, so are we dating kind of questions or are you hitting on me? Um, or are we really close friends kind of questions without, whereas like in neurotypical or holistic culture that can be seen as too blunt. Of course, we, it depends on the culture, the actual culture, culture. <laughs> Uh, let's see, what else? Uh, autistic people in, in speaking, we tend to use echolalia. We just have, tend to have echolalia at least some of the time. Um, and that can show up in all kinds of ways. It's not just rep repeating 
what other people say to us. It can be just mimicking the ways in which people speak, accents, quotes, song lyrics, um, even pacing. And there's nothing wrong with it. I think a lot of people are like, oh, echolalia is so strange. Well, I've had relationships with people who were echolalic and it's, you know, it's just a different way of communicating. Um, would you tend to be more blunt and factual? And then the way that we communicate or interact with people can be very different when we're masking and not masking. And that can be confusing to others because they may think, oh, is, are you being fake? Is that not really you? Or how come you can go to a party and be really friendly and you, yet you say that you're autistic and these type of social situations are too difficult for you? Or, um, yeah, there can be some confusion from people in our lives around why masking seems to create, like, we can be one way one day and another way another day or in a different setting. Uh, all this, uh, autistic people, especially children, often get um, told that they are lazy, manipulative, or rude, even when that is absolutely not their intention. And I think as, as autistic people grow and develop into adulthood, many of us do figure out ways to not be perceived as rude, lazy, or manipulative. Many autistic people, if they're not feeling like they can do a social thing, will say, oh, I'm sick, or they'll use some kind of other socially acceptable reason to get out of things um, so that they don't sound rude. Um, you know, I think understanding why we do the things we do is really important for our holistic or neurotypical friends and family so that we don't get perceived as being selfish because we have needs or rude because we like to talk about facts or manipulative, again, because we have certain needs that feel really important sensory-wise, etc., or processing-wise. Um, or that they understand that we're not being lazy, that it's really has a lot to do with our spoons, our energy levels, and kind of us having to go through a lot to, to be in neurotypical society. Many autistic people have experienced bullying or being taken advantage of. And so that's part of why it's really important that autistic children, young people, but also adults, feel supported to self-advocate or that the environment is just already um, autism affirming so that there isn't a space created for bullies to be like, what's wrong with you? Or you're so weird or you're so, you know, you don't fit into this space. If the space and the, the people who are in it are commit to be being autism affirming like a school um, or a home, then much less bullying is going to happen for autistic people and probably for other neurodivergent people as well. Um, we do tend to script, which I think probably goes under, under the topic of um, masking that I had just covered, but scripting is totally fine. There's nothing wrong with scripting. It, it can be exhausting, but it's kind of figuring out ahead of time what you're going to say in a social situation like how am i going to you know autistic people are famous for having figured out like everything that they would possibly say in a situation like that's coming up the next day or revisiting conversations to kind of figure out what they may have done wrong or what they did right and then using that almost scientific you know information that they've gathered to communicate again in the future and there's nothing wrong with scripting it's totally a fine way to do things except that it can be exhausting to the to the autistic person if we feel like we have to script every interaction so as an autistic person you may start paying attention to when you feel like you have to script 
um, ahead of time and in which situations you don't and trying to balance out your life to where you have more of those times where you can just be with somebody and just speak as you need to speak or not speak. I think for many of us give, being given the permission to not talk is wonderful. There have been so many times in my life where I wish somebody had just said, you know, we can just hang out together. We don't have to talk. Um, and as you continue in your own self advocacy, you, you may find that there's situations in which you say to somebody, I really want to be with you, but I'm not feeling talkative. And you can explain ahead of time, like, Hey, I'm autistic. And there are times when I don't feel talkative and I'll communicate that to you. Um, and then that gives the other person a chance to be like, okay, that's fine with me. I still want to be with you, even if we're not talking a ton. Or, oh, let's get together when you're feeling more up for being talkative. Um, we do, you know, one of the things I think really for me points to the fact that it's a fallacy that we don't, we aren't relational, is that I think we're sometimes more relation, re relational than um, some neurotypical people because not only do we relate to other people, we really relate strongly to animals and objects. Maybe not all autistic people, but many, many, many autistic people will relate super strongly to like books or um, nature or their pets, animals, um, collections, ideas, data. We can have real strong attachments to objects that other people might be like, well, just get rid of that. You could get a new one. Or why are you talking to that? Or why have you named your this or that? Um, and, you know, I think it's quite lovely. And I, I've talked about it before, this kind of concept of animism or um, object per personification. Autistic people do tend to ask a lot of questions in relationship. And again, it's something that I find beautiful. I can't imagine not asking people why or what or how, um, when, you know, all of the, the, the great question words. Um, but a lot of people are um, more, like a lot of people have, a lot of autistic people have had the experience of asking why questions and then being treated as if we were being rude. So where at, wherein for us, it's just like, I really need that completionism or I need that closure to understand. I really wanna understand why, instead of just being told, hey, we're doing this. And yet in neurotypical society, there, is, there can be like an unspoken rule of asking why is seen as rude. Um, we tend to not like small talk. Uh, that's kind of a joke amongst autistic people. Many of us can do it, but it's like not fun, you know? Some of us are experts at it. Uh, I learned from my autistic dad how to make conversation with anyone anywhere by giving compliments, making little humble jokes, and uh, you know, there's just little different little things that I learned from him of how to, to communicate with strangers. That is very much masking for me. Uh, and at this point, I guess it, it's kind of melded with who I am as well, because I think I do like to make feel people feel comfortable. I think that's an innate thing to me, but I'm also love to just go to a city where I don't know anyone and not talk to anyone for the day. Like that's like, it's like a dream day for me. <laughs> I mean, I love my family and stuff too, but, but I love the idea of just going somewhere and not having to ever do any small talk because it does take energy from me. As we talk about autistic people and relationships, we want to keep in mind our unreliably speaking or non-speaking autistic friends and family. Um, some of you who are listening are probably non-speaking or unreliably speaking and just to remember that that part of the autistic population those people are often not listened to not 
their needs are not paid attention to or they're left out of conversations. So as a community, we kind of always want to be checking the room, making sure those people are invited to our community conversations. And then when we talk about being autistic, we want to make sure that we're doing so in a way that includes them. Um, and non-reliably speaking, I would consider myself to be somewhat non-reliably speaking only in that I will stutter and I will lose words. I have had times more when I'm in shutdown where I will completely stop talking, um, although that is fairly rare for me these days. Um, but unreliably speaking is just what it sounds like. Like there may, you may have a child who have, has selective mutism and sometimes speaks and sometimes doesn't. You may have an adult who sometimes is able to speak when they're well resourced and sometimes is not. Or you may have an unreliably speaking adult who has made the decision that spoken word is really hard for them. So they're using more of the, um, AAC, which is, uh, I can't remember what it stands for, but basically using communication devices or chat features. Um, so there's like text to speech um, apps where you can text and then it speaks for you. And I have used those with people. Sometimes people think it's kind of, they act, they act a little strange too when you do it, but um, sometimes it's totally worth it. And especially if you have kids who want to do that, allowing them to do that can be such a freeing thing, such a nice way to help them feel comfortable in their lives. And then um, if you let people know, sometimes I will use text-to-speech when I'm feeling out of words or I'm, I need to, then pe most people will be really understanding. And you can... Um, you can designate which type of voice you want to use on most of those apps too. Like there's a variety of accents, genders, um, part of the way people sound gender wise. Um, and so that's always something to keep in mind, like keep our non-speaking people in mind. We tend not to use non-verbal. I'm sure I slip up and say non-verbal sometimes, but the reason we do that is because it's an assumption that those people are not verbal when many of them may be capable of understanding language or creating language through symbol or creating some language through written text or device, they just are not mouth words using. And many, many, many of those people have what's called apraxia of speech. And the word, the thoughts are there. Sometimes, the many times the words are there and yet the ability to create the actual spoken words is not there. And everyone should, and I'm gonna say should, but I think it's helpful for everyone to know that language, um, spoken language is actually quite difficult. Like humans probably weren't meant to use spoken language in the, the intricate way that we do. It's a very, very, very hard skill to learn and so um, I think that's an important thing to know. Loneliness is often a key piece in thinking about autistic experience and in healing our autistic experiences under like looking at the ways in which we feel loneliness or the philosophy almost ex existentially looking at loneliness and that's actually a group I'd like to run in the future is looking at um, loneliness and the autistic experience. You know, people joke around about autistic love languages. I think that's always helpful to look into, but like the idea of penguin pedal, uh, is it penguin pebbling? Where autistic people, and this is so me, will be like, oh, I found this rock, it reminded me of you, here. Or, oh, I saw this article, it reminded me of you, here. Like, there's, um, that's a way of, for us to show love. Or um, parallel play, which would be just coming and being together, doing different things, but being together would be an, aust an autistic love language. So looking into those, I think, is very useful. 
um, many autistic people will express that they have studied other people like at some point in their life maybe they would have been perceived by um others that, like neurotypical people as being having less needs as an autistic person because at uh sorry i'm gonna mess this up basically that they that at some point we start masking and really studying how humans interact and how humans are and so then there may be a big bump in how we're perceived functioning wise by um, neurotypical people so like when I was a kid I was very much seen as a child who was very different or who had um, communication maybe cognitive differences and then I really really remember studying at the beginning of middle school just studying people like i would read books like how to win friends and influence people and i would just sit there and watch the other kids at school how they were talking to each other and i was always listening for what people liked um so that i could memorize that and then do that and i think that's actually made me a better therapist because when i'm working with clients I'm always listening for their own specific preferences, their own specific interpretations of the world and kind of memorizing them for them. Like, oh, this person, you know, had a miscarriage and really felt that nobody listened to them, nobody cared about them, and they wish that people had been more willing to talk about the subject. I remember that. Um, and so that's a common experience many autistic people have the experience have experiences when they were little of what did they do when they had free time would often be some type of physical repetitive movement or um playing with collections or going off to be alone to reset um i think that's kind of it for today for speaking about relationships and communication there you know i'm sure there's more that can be covered here but that was those were the main things that i wanted to talk about please feel free to leave a comment or a question below and um thank you so much bye